For Kremer Media's Policy, I'm Sane Lameni. Dr. Errol Holland joins me to discuss his book titled A Life of Color. Welcome, Doctor. Oh, thank thanks you for so your much. time. The book sets the scene by telling us about the young uh, Dr. Errol Holland at Baragwanath Hospital working in a trauma section in, in 1976 during the Soweto uprising. Tell us what you remember about that time. Well, thank you. Firstly, let me thank Kremia Media for uh, inviting me here this afternoon. Yes. This morning, actually. <laughs> and thanks so much. Yes. Um, at the time that uh, the event happened on June the 16th, mm. you know, I was uh, not working in casualty. Mm. I was a, um, a registrar in training towards a specialist degree in internal medicine. And part of that was uh, my rotation in cardiology. Mm. We were watching and uh, kind of learning too about all about ca cardiac catheterization. And then a call came in that they need a cardiologist there. Um, I wasn't a qualified cardiologist, <laughs> but I was time. the available one because yeah. I was not involved in the cardiac catheterization procedure. Mm. I had no clue as to what was going on. Mm. And then I walked up, you know, Baraguanathi is like a whole system of corridors. And I walked up there, and uh, as I got nearer to the uh, emergency room, uh, which is in the casualty section, mm. you know, there were crowds and crowds of students, and I didn't know what was going on. And I went towards the, the uh, suscitation room, which is where I saw everybody's gathering. Mm. And I got there, and the, the place was crowded with students. With, uh, 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 and, uh, you know, that's not usually a place. It mm. is a place which is really restricted to medical staff only. Yeah. But everybody was crowded around this central uh, station, the bed, in, uh, which was right in the middle of this crowd, and worked my way through to, uh, to the bed. And uh, a surgeon was busy there. Mm. He was looking at this very young, strapping man, young man. And he was usually a very arrogant individual, you know, he used to a surgeon's a very brash surgeon and mm. he always used to walk around and he had with his gun strapped to his to his holster mm. and working in a very dangerous place as it <laughs> <laughs> in his perception yeah. and he was there with this young man's chest opened mm. and in his hand he has had this young man's heart and he was pumping this young man's heart mm. And for the first time, I saw him with humility, and he looked to be in fear, because mm. everybody's eyes were peeled on this situation, mm. and the young man was, uh, was dead already. Mm. But he was trying to, and therefore calling for a cardiologist, which mm. he never would have done before, mm. you know. But because of the situation, he had decided to, that uh, he needed the help of a cardiologist, and there was nothing to help. The, the young man mm. had passed on. And that was one of the most, not knowing, not expecting that, was the one of the most shocking things I've experienced in my entire life. Mm. Leaving there, it was a very surreal picture because there were rows and rows of young people uh, with uh, suffering from shotguns and, uh, and you know, these, these shotgun pellets, and uh, rows and rows of them were sitting over there. And I wandered around as if in a daze, and I went to the various, worked my way to the resuscitation room post-op. Mm -hmm. And there, you know, there were beds all occupied with young people, either having, preparing, ready to go into theater, mm -hmm. or coming back from theater on, the, with, on respirators, and others just lying, uh, having lost their lives. I remember this young girl, about uh, 13 or 14 years old, with a large bullet wound going right in the fr uh, front of her head and coming out with a larger hole at the back. And, you know, it was this type of unbelievable, unforgettable inf uh, experience which is imprinted in my mind. And um, 
we wandered around. We went to the the post op room, and there were the beds. Of the, of the, uh, that room, you know, is a, usually a, a ward full of people who had just been treated and uh, really just needed a time in hospital. And those beds were packed all with bullet wounds, mm -hmm. shotgun wounds, and you know, it was. I felt a, such a sense of helplessness. Because I look after people whose bodies are damaged, mm. you know, from disease, and uh, and that's what internal medicine wa was all about. And yeah, to see these healthy young people with whole lives ahead of them mm. lying there in that state was far too traumatic for me. And I then went out to the front of casualty, you know, and it was just an unbelievable situation of cars coming in, ambulances coming in through the gate and you could stand there and look at the entrance they would come in and all the staff and people and the people around mm. surrounding the entrance to the emergency room and as they'll see another car coming in or um, you know a, a, a taxi, the taxis played a huge role that time mm. They would all start screaming, Amandla, Amandla. And the car would come in from, from the gate and come in and turn there and uh, park in front of the casualty to deliver yet another wounded student. And people were screaming, Amandla, Amandla. And the door would open and this young person would just be flopping out or be carried out. And the strange thing is that None of those youngsters s had a tear in their eyes. They mm. got out of there with their arms raised, fists raised, a man line, the crowd was in and way to and whatever. And that happened throughout the day. Wow. And it was probably seat so imprinted in my mind and one of the most traumatic things I've ever experienced mm. for most of that day. And were you politically aware of what was happening around I the country at the time? I then discovered that this was June 16, mm. and that had happened and gleaned the whole story of the students marching mm. to Orlando Stadium and, uh, and the police uh, then opening fire on these, on these youngsters. And, uh, you know, so it was from then onwards, your life changed, mm. you know, completely. And is the book targeted to, to any specific audience, if I may ask? Well, you know, I, I think that this, the world at the current time mm. has got so much to learn from the past history of uh, uh, what has been happening in this country. Mm. And it has gone into a very, very ugly state. The whole world globally is in an ugly state. Mm. Got human rights is being ignored. Mm. You're finding that. Uh, uh, this whole migrant policy uh, abroad is very cruel. And uh, I can't forget that picture of that young baby mm. lying on the beach with a sailor suit on and dead. Mm. And that to me is, says something about our humanity and approach to fellow human beings. And more recently, this whole issue about uh, babies and children being torn from their mothers and their parents mm. and put in wire cages tells me that we've got to a gutter level of humanity mm. and morals. And I just think that is why, I mean, the book is dedicated to the children mm. of the world. And the second part of the dedication is there directed to us, every single individual, no matter where you are, mm. no matter which group you fall into. Mm that it is our historic ob uh, um, obligation to, in fact, look at this world mm. and find solutions. I don't have solutions. I've been in, in uh, a political act activist for uh, over 35 years now and, you know, worked in various institutions. And, you know, following on 76, we uh, ha established uh, organizations which went through various phases mm. And, but always with the whole question about people's health as foremost and addressing the broader political situation mm. in there. And throughout all this, there are consistent messages that I believe mm. should be transmitted 
to the rest of the world, the global community of mm -hmm. people, of peace-loving people, humane people, mm -hmm. and people looking, looking towards justice and equity, because that is really what the world needs now, to give our children a better chance mm -hmm. in the, uh, in the, for the future. You, you grew up in coronation, a, a then colored community under the apartheid regime. Can you remind us what it was like growing up in that area? He, you, you know, we, I'm, not, I'm definitely not a wealthy individual, but my, mm -hmm. my parents were teachers. Yes. And uh, the, they brought us up with a creed of uh, respect for people. I was a, a very good Methodist at the time, mm -hmm. because we were, you know, that was an expectation of our parents. Yeah. And education was one of the things that were held paramount. So that combination mm -hmm. of, uh, of spirituality and respect for education mm -hmm. and uh, was the ethos we were brought up, but all towards a serving other people. That's how I was grew, grown up. Mm -hmm. and. I was in the middle of nine children, and uh, all of us had an opportunity of uh, going on to higher education. So without me thinking about it, I mean, I was just knew that was an expectation that I had to go to university. Mm -hmm. you know, uh, but um, within that, I had a wonderful upbringing. Mm -hmm. We were nine children, and certainly not wealthy. My, you know, the times that. Uh, that uh, teaching of people of color mm. was not really valued. And the, the salaries they used to earn was mm. very, very little. And bringing up nine children must have been a oh. huge feat. Yeah. And, uh, but the magic of it is that my d mom and dad never made us feel poor. I never considered myself as poor. Mm. I certainly, we certainly, we know when you had a piece of, of meat, mm. we had a small couple of inches of meat, but we had meat. Yeah. We had fish, we had lovely Easter uh, dinner, uh, lunches mm. and Christmas lunches and all the, the good things. So I never felt poor. Retrospectively, mm. I do realize that, that it was, must have not have been, a, uh, a, must have been easy. Mm. My father never, did, we never de felt deprived of everything. Sweets, children love sweets. We used mm. to buy a packet of sweets a month and every day we used to get one of the sweets. So we never f uh, were short of sweets. Mm. We never felt deprived at all. And so, but my childhood was a wonder in that sense, mm. you know. Mm. And you also say you always knew that you and your family were second class citizens. How so? Well, I think we all grow up with the consciousness mm. that we are here, mm. we see that uh, people on the uh, on the one side are being treated very badly, worse than what we were, mm. and that was the whole sort of strategy of separate development and apartheid, is that they give us a little bit better mm. than, than uh, uh, people at that side, mm. and across the the felt, <laughs> this is a funny felt piece because at the end of the road of coronation, mm. and we lived just a couple of blocks before the end, yeah. there was this uh, uh, about a kilometer a wide area of open felt, which was no man's land. Oh. And it was empty, open. And we enjoyed our summer, year after year, winters stumping through that area. Mm. But at the other end was the white area mm. of Crosby. And so as you used to get play and play with, when you get nearer to that area, you're yeah. wary because there was, <laughs> was virtually a, a war between the two, you mm. know. And, uh, you know, often people used to ride through that area to get to the city mm. and used to be assaulted. And, uh, and they never used to venture m anywhere over that about uh, 50 meter <laughs> mark. <laughs> so mm -hmm. it was one of those things. Mm -hmm. And so you knew the politics of the time. Yeah. And you could sense that when you ride or you go to see the wonderful living areas, the beautiful schools, the well-equipped schools, mm -hmm. and you look at your own, mm -hmm. and you then say, well, you know, we, you certainly this is where we are rated. Yeah. And whereas if uh, we knew that the poor conditions, mm -hmm. and we we're could see the, the poor side. conditions living of people much, much worse than we were. Mm -hmm. And this is the whole type of, 
of, of approach and strategy of separate development, let the one feel a little bit better, better. than the other, mm -hmm. and it creates that buffer zone mm -hmm. between the, 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 the various races, which is, mm -hmm. it is iniquitous, mm -hmm. because we all aspire to the very same thing for our children. Yeah. And we want the very best for our children, very best education, mm -hmm. the, very, the means towards feeding our children, mm -hmm. means towards bringing them up as we should be. But it's, um, the poorer you are, the more difficult it is mm -hmm. to, in fact, uh, accomplish that. Yeah, and then you lost your father while you were uh, still a, medic a medical student. Tell us about that period in your life. I was a rebel, you know, and... Uh, you know, uh, my brothers and sisters had all gone to university and mm -hmm. I just knew I had to go and I was really just uh, um, going along as, 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 a, a, as a task that I had to do, mm -hmm. you know, and I went to the um, U University of Western Cape, which was then Belleville College, as it was called, and a derogatory name of Bush College, you mm -hmm. know, and uh, I, I was serendipitously uh, I've uh, I chose science because uh, you know I was not really your best student <laughs> and <laughs> but I because I, uh, I I didn't want to do a lot of memory work mm. I felt that things like uh, mathematics were easy to work out and you can find solutions and it's easy to do and my mm. brother used to coach me <laughs> in medicine in, in mathematics mm. so I used to love that and accounting is really the laws and whether you know there's no memorizing work and whatever yeah. so the easiest one for me <laughs> to do was was uh, B, was become and i went to uwc and uh, they had this broad hall uh, filled with all the first year students and on the right hand side were all the rowdy art students to my right Mm. as you were sitting in that lecture hall, that massive lecture hall. Mm. On my left were all the uh, science, even rowdier science students. <laughs> and we were the sedate group front row, one single row of uh, BCom <laughs> students. Mm. And I looked that side and looked at that side. And the next time I did, I went on to the science group and that's how I got to do science. Mm. And I did uh, BSc for two years. And after that, um, I then, uh, my father assisted me and he used to all do that type of thing, being so conscious and mm. eager and for education for us all. Mm. And he had made the applications for me to get to UCT into medical school. And therefore, from second year medicine, I went directly into sec uh, second year science. I went directly into second year uh, medicine. Mm. And for the first time, I felt something meaningful to me. Because, uh, you know, the science, the, the uh, medical degree, the first year is to do all the basic sciences mm. and, you know, botany, zoology, uh, mm. chemistry and physics. And that, those, all those I, I had completed at, uh, at UWC. Mm. And uh, I was then put into second year medicine, but then came the real stuff, the anatomy the dissections of, in anatomy where mm. you could see this workings, the inside structure mm. of the body. And combined with that was physiology, how each system works and the integration of how anatomy gives you is as the, the structure of the body meets the requirements of how it works so fantastically. Mm. And I felt for the first time there was meaning in my life. And so at that end of that second year, during that year, I then came to, to the realization of the truths of my father and all the things he was, he was trying to teach me, which I was so resistant against. Mm. And I then started, was during that year, r more and more letters saying, yes, I understand. Mm. Yes, I know now. I'm coming to my realization that this is what you, what you were, were aiming for, mm. because now I feel meaningful in my life. Mm. And, uh, you know, it is then at the end of the year, of that year, when the results came out, and I had seen that I had passed, and I was going on to my third year. Mm. And, you know, we were all in a state of euphoria and everybody was going off to the beach and uh, in Cape Town and mm. having fun. And somehow within myself, I, 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 I felt that, no, man, this, 
I really needed to, I was so grateful to my dad mm. for guiding me and, and so sorry that I never had an opportunity to say thank you to him, you know. Mm. And I said, no, I want to go straight home. I, I just uh, took my, in a very pensive mood. Mm. And, I, oh, you know, it is a pensive state just enveloped me. Mm. And, you know, I, I had to tell, walk to the bus stop and take a bus and, and g from to where I was boarding. Mm. And as I was going along the road, I saw this, this man, this car coming up the road. And I recognized him as my principal of my high school. And I used to be at his house because he had three sons who I was friends with, oh. all of them. And I used to be at his house often. And when I saw him coming up, my natural reaction would have been to say, hey, mm. I'm gonna, but I, something was within me and I didn't want to do that. Mm. And I just walked on without even uh, uh, hoping that he doesn't recognize me. And I turned into my, in my home, my boarding home. But something was telling me that it was something. And when the door, a knock came on the door, I knew it was him. And I went in and he said, no, you know, I have to go to uh, Johannesburg immediately. I had bought me an a, a, a air ticket. Mm -hmm. Never happened before. We used to travel up and down all the years uh, by, by train. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, that, uh, I, just, I just knew that there was something wrong with my mm. dad. Not with my mom, for some so many reason. Mm. I just knew it was my dad. They didn't tell me what it is. Mm. And I was quiet all the way through the, the... I should have been excited for my first air flight. But it was, but it was I felt that deep, a sort of a sense of gloom coming over me. And mm. when my brothers came to meet me at the airport, they held me tight and I said, don't worry, I know my dad has passed away without mm. ever being told. Mm. So it was one of those mysterious things that in my life which was very deep to me. Thank you, Doctor. That was Dr. Errol Holland speaking to Polity about his book titled A Life of Color.